This is a quick addition from Plain Spoken that we're going to call Plain Simple. Uh, we may evolve this into a coffee talk kind of format, but what I want to discuss today is constructive conflict. I spent a, a good number of years at Microsoft out in Redmond in the late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, it was a uh, heated environment. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, there was certainly a personality type that enjoyed that constant level of conflict. But what it triggered in me was the belief that you need something that I've called constructive conflict in any environment, which means you want everyone to feel empowered to disagree. You want disparate ideas. You want a challenge from within your organization. Many times at Microsoft, our biggest competitor was across the street, but still on campus. They were another Microsoft arm. And so in a given room, when you're competing for mindshare, ideas, vision, ideally in your team, which is set up with different personalities and backgrounds and experiences, you want to have that constructive conflict so that as a byproduct or as an output rather of that meeting, you can have the best idea come to the surface. Now, in order to have constructive conflict, you have to have an incredible amount of trust between the members of the room because that can get very heated. It can get heated quickly. And and that should be okay. It's when there's when there's increased pressure and tone and all of these sorts of things that quite often are, you know, sort of couched as negatives in a work environment. If you can retrain the focus towards never being mad at a person, but rather being upset with a problem. And if people understand that that's true, it can't just be words, it can't be lip service. It has to be absolutely part of your culture, that you're attacking problems, not people, that is founded in trust. And that allows you to have this constructive conflict, right? So there is also a smattering of good faith. You have to believe that when people give you feedback and sometimes contrarian feedback to your idea, when you think you've got the next great vision and they say, wow, that's really kind of a piece of shit. You have to know they're not saying you're a piece of shit. They, they're saying that that idea is bad. And, and what really is incumbent on you is to find out why they see it that way. Because you're going to bring your own bias to the table. And by doing all of these things, setting up these parts of your culture to allow the attack of a, of a problem, not a person, that constructive conflict, the willingness to, to have that sort of increased emotional responses around these discussions you can actually allow your environment to use something that we've called, I don't believe that we coined this phrase, but disagree and commit. So when you have to make decisions after all those conversations have happened and you end up with two or three or four paths that you could take as a leadership team, being able to realize you can't take all of those paths simultaneously. You have to converge on one and you won't always converge by agreeing. And quite often it will look like you do. People will say that you do, but that is not correct. It is, it is in fact, a misrepresentation. They will, in the back of their mind, say, well, we'll do number two, but I think number three is the best one. And when you do that implicitly, when people have that be unspoken, it can erode the trust. It can erode the power of a team. It's better to have folks be able to disagree, but commit to a path. And that can only happen if you have trust and a strong team. Because otherwise, if you take the path and it fails, that person's going to say, well, yeah, well, I didn't want to go that way anyway. That's not the point. The point is, as a team, you've used constructive conflict to derive a plan that has arrived at a path, and you are now all going to row towards that path because it's the best next step. And you're going at it with good faith.